Hi oh, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today we continue our 10 flaw series with a positive spin. In our last episode, we looked at one of the most capable bombers of the Clone Wars and Galactic Civil War period, the Y-Wing. We came to the conclusion that although the Y-Wing does not excel in any particular way, it performed quite well in combat and had an efficiency that its competitors lacked. Like Jeremy Renner, Tom Hardy, or a Toyota Camry, the Y-Wing was relatively unassuming at first glance, but consistently able to deliver solid performances. Anyway, the starship we're going to be looking at today is the exact opposite of the Y-Wing. This is a starfighter that is constantly trying to push the envelope of what is possible for a starfighter to achieve performance-wise. And it's a starship that really likes to be noticed, and in all fairness, probably deserves to be noticed. We, of course, are talking about the RZ-1 A-Wing. The RZ-1 A-Wing was a product of the famous Starship manufacturer Quad Systems Engineering. Towards the end of the Clone Wars, Quad Systems Engineering began looking at a new prototype known as the R-22 Project, a successor to the Delta-7 Aether Sprite Light Interceptor. The R-22 Spearhead was built on lessons learned from the Jedi Starfighter and other Clone Wars era ships like the ETA Actus II and B-Wing. It improved on their performance and weight. Even at the prototype stage, the R-22 was considered as one of the best airframes ever designed. But the Galactic Empire rejected mass production for this model. We're not really sure why they did this, but legend stats show us that the RZ-1 A-Wing, which is based on the R-22 prototype, cost 175,000 credits per unit. Almost three times more than the 60,000 credits per unit the TIE Fighter in Space Superiority Fighter cost. So in the end, it came down to cost, probably. I mean, it does make sense why equip your galaxy-wide navy with the Star Wars equivalent of a Corvette Stingray when a more economical, let's say, Volkswagen Beetle can do the job reasonably well. And at least in the short run, everything seemed to work pretty well until those VW bugs started encountering those Corvettes. And ultimately, the Galactic Empire probably regretted choosing the TIE platform over the R-22 platform. Today, we're going to be looking at 10 reasons why the A-Wing was the best interceptor in the galaxy. The A-Wing can be described in its most basic form as a pair of giant engines with a cockpit strapped to it. It's the same concept that has been challenging man since he first strapped an engine onto a horse carriage or a bicycle. It's really the noblest and manliest of pursuits. How do I get the biggest engine onto the smallest and lightest frame? The answer for the A-Wing was the extremely small and light R-22 platform combined with a pair of J-77 Event Horizon sublight drives. And these engines were probably named after an Event Horizon in a black hole, which is physically impossible to escape from, unless maybe you have a pair of J-77s. The engines were a bit overkill, to put it lightly. The extremely light A-Wing frame needed only a fraction of its power, which is why the A-Wing is officially the fastest sublight vessel in the Star Wars Galaxy. We actually did a whole video ranking the fastest ships in the Star Wars Galaxy here. You can check it out in the top right corner. But after you finish this video first, because we've got some really interesting things to discuss. At 120 MGLT, or megalights per hour, a unit used in Star Wars to measure sublight speed of starships, the A-Wing created a lot of problems for the Empire. The quick slashing attacks it was known for were simply too fast for any standard Imperial ship to counter. The TIE in space superiority fighter, while considered very fast, only had a speed of 100 MGLT. The Empire would go on to design the TIE Interceptor specifically to counter the A-Wing, but even then the Interceptor was never able to top 110 MGLT. MGLT. The only other craft that was able to get even close to the A-Wing's top speed was another ship we actually mentioned in our previous video, the ETA-2 Actus Light Interceptor. It had a top speed of 118 MGLT. Aerodynamics is just something a lot of Starship designers and Star Wars don't think about. Besides a TIE Striker, there are very few atmosphere-specific craft with proper airframes designed for minimal air resistance and maximum lift. This has to do with the fact that deflector shields and inertial compensators allow starships to fly in atmosphere, ignoring the effects of gravity and air resistance, more or less. This is how completely not airworthy craft like the TIE Fighters are able to fly at all and maneuver at high speeds without ripping itself apart. The A-Wing, however, was one of the few starships that didn't actually need deflector shields or inertial compensators to fly in atmosphere. If you put it in a wind tunnel, it would actually perform relatively well. YouTuber E.C. Henry plopped the A-Wing down in a virtual wind tunnel simulator and found out that the A-Wing had one of the lowest drag coefficient ratings of all Star Wars ships. At 0.17, it was only beaten by the Naboo Starfighter. The lower a drag coefficient number is, the less air resistance a frame has. 
Just for reference though, modern jet fighters usually have an even lower drag coefficient score in the 0.02 or 0.03 range. So the A-Wing still depends a little bit on future check to keep it flying. Admittedly, the aerodynamic shape of the A-Wing is probably just an unintentional side effect of the designers trying to find the most durable shape for a frame possible. This was important because in order to maintain that incredible power to weight ratio, the A-Wing frame had to be partially made from carboplast, an extremely lightweight carbon-based plastic that was combined with a more traditional titanium alloy frame. This was the real secret behind the A-Wing design, this lightweight material combined with a very durable wedge-shaped frame. This is why Senior Fleet Systems was never able to replicate the same type of speed with their own TIE Fighter line. On top of this light frame, the A-Wing had a traditional Durasteel outer hull which gave it a respectable 14 RU. RU is a legendary rating for hull strength. In comparison, the X-Wing had a RU of 20 and the base model TIE Fighter had a RU of only 9. And unlike most TIE Fighters, the A-Wing had a shield system, the Surplex Z9 Deflector Shield, and this was rated at 50 SPD. SPD is a legendary shield strength rating system. The X-Wing also had a shield rated at 50 SPD, so despite its name Slim, for a slim chance of a pilot surviving a direct hit, the A-Wing was actually quite well protected from enemy fire compared to even larger and more defensive-minded Starfighters. And it was definitely better protected than most interceptors in its class. The white shape hole also had another unintentional use. Combined with a heat shield on the front of the bow for atmospheric entry, the A-Wing actually made a terrific battering ram. During the Battle of Endor, Commander Krynite of Green Squadron experienced catastrophic failure with his A-Wing after it was struck full on by a turbo laser. Krynite's A-Wing went into an uncontrollable spin, but the pilot was able to steer the craft right through the bridge of an Imperial Super Star Destroyer, causing it to lose control just enough to get trapped into the gravity well of the second Death Star and crash into it. It's probably not the best use for such an expensive starfighter, but you know, one A-Wing for an entire Super Star Destroyer is a really good trade-off for the Rebellion. It also should keep most pilots pretty comfortable knowing that their starfighter will stay intact even if they crash right through a transparent steel window. The X-Wing along with most Incom design starfighters were easy to pilot, and even a cadet could push the X-Wing pretty hard and get a lot of performance out of the craft. That's probably one of the reasons why the Rebellion chose the X-Wing in the first place. The A-Wing, on the other hand, was definitely not an entry-level starfighter. Only the most talented and experienced pilots were assigned to the A-Wing. The controls on the ship were extremely sensitive and unrestricted. The incredible thrust to weight ratio of the ship meant that the wrong inputs into the controls could oftentimes lead to the ship spinning out of control. A smart A-Wing pilot, however, understood that the A-Wing was not designed for a turning fight. It was designed instead to pounce on enemy fighters and quickly get away. A smart A-Wing pilot will only engage an enemy if they don't see them first, and then make a quick slashing run at their flank or rear and destroy the enemy fighter before they even know what hit them. This was only made easier by the excellent visibility afforded to an A-Wing pilot by its bubble canopy. And should an A-Wing pilot find itself on the receiving end of an attack run, they can just use their superior speed to get away and find a more advantageous position. Some A-Wings even had articulating laser cannons, which meant that the A-Wing could fire off four, which was a pretty big surprise for enemy fighters. The A-Wing also had some uh, other additional offensive and defensive weapons that made it a very capable dogfighter, but we'll talk about that later. Despite its incredibly small size, the A-Wing was still equipped with a hyperdrive. The Incom GBK-785, which was rated at a blistering fast Class 1.0. Although, admittedly, there are some limitations with this hyperdrive because the first iteration of the A-Wing was too small to fit a socket for an astromech. This meant before a mission, pilots had to actually download hyperspace uh, jump coordinates into their nav computer. And usually these computers can only hold two or three different coordinates, which kind of limited the use of the hyperdrive. The A-Wing was used in a variety of different roles, including anti-starship defense, air superiority, and of course, interception. But what it was most well known for and probably most suited for was reconnaissance. In one of our last videos, we took a look at the 10 flaws of the ARC-170 aggressive reconnaissance craft. I argue that aggressive reconnaissance is a strange term. Usually recon means staying hidden and out of sight while gathering information. The large and slow ARC-170 was poorly built and poorly suited for this kind of mission, but one craft that actually performed perfectly in this role was the A-Wing. As we mentioned before, it was extremely fast, it had an excellent hyperdrive, and it was quite maneuverable and small in size. 
On top of that, the ship was full of the latest scanner, sensors, and multi-spectral imaging hardware. It also had a military-grade jamming system, which could cause havoc with enemy snub fighter comms and even targeting systems. The A-Wing was able to fulfill the aggressive reconnaissance role quite well. This was because not only was it quite stealthy, it was also surprisingly heavily armed for such a small ship. The A-Wing had two concussion missile launchers concealed in its hull, which each carried six missiles. I'm not really sure where it had room to carry so many missiles, but these missiles made the A-Wing incredibly deadly. Guided munitions were terrific in an anti-fighter role, but also were effective against larger ships. The A-Wing's famous slashing techniques usually involved a squadron of A-Wing's fighters appearing out of hyperspace doing a quick attack run on an Imperial capital ship or facility, and then quickly disappearing back into hyperspace. It was a strategy that the Imperials had a tough time stopping even with interdictor ships. That is what I call aggressive reconnaissance. On top of its insane top speed, heavy weapons payload, unexpectedly tough armor and shields, advanced hyperdrive, and also very, very complicated sensors package, the A-Wing also had a pretty wide range of safety measures, including a full life support system and ejection seats. It even had a flare and chaff launcher for countermeasures on top of sensor jamming capabilities. The A-Wing makes the TIE Fighter look like a joke. The A-Wing was over-engineered and ahead of its time. It single-handedly made the Empire question its own Starfighter doctrine and design. But there was one major flaw with the A-Wing. The combination of so many complicated systems along with the small size of the craft meant that maintenance was incredibly difficult for the A-Wing, which meant that it was one of the less reliable fighters in the Rebellion stable. On top of that, the A-Wing was being assembled in small scale in secret underground facilities. This meant that manufacturing quality and also even the parts varied from one installation to another. This further decreased the reliability of the A-Wing and also made maintenance even more difficult because every A-Wing was basically different. Some early models even had wooden paneling. The RZ-2 A-Wing project was started right after the Battle of Endor and one of the key changes was that Incom Corporation, designer and manufacturer of the X-Wing line of Starfighters took over all production for the A-Wing. And for the first time in its history, the A-Wing was being mass-produced with standard parts and reliable manufacturing processes. The RZ-2 A-Wing also had some minor changes that fixed many of its major flaws, including giving it an even heavier shield and armor, along with astromech compatibility. In Legends, the RZ-2 A-Wing would continue to see action well into the New Republic era and even during the Yuzhang Vong War. It was one of the few ships that could keep up with the Yuzhang Vong coral skippers in speed. In canon, RZ-2 A-Wing would be cut from the New Republic spending package after their rapid demilitarization, but the Resistance was smart enough to continue to field these interceptors, which were very effective against the First Order's own TIE Fighters. The RZ-2 still kept the spirit of the original A-Wing and R-22 platform. It was a ship designed for pilots who, like all the user assist, turned off. No auto-aim, no ABS, or traction control. This was for the pilot who liked the inertial dampeners dialed down to 95. It's for the pilot who believes that the Starfighter is only as good as its pilot. And had the Jedi still been alive in force during this time period, this would have been the only ship that would have challenged their incredible force senses and piloting skills. So guys, that is our analysis of the A-Wing and why we think it's one of the best starfighters in the galaxy. Now, if you guys like these kind of videos, we have an entire playlist of like 16 videos where we're looking at the 10 flaws and advantages of various vehicles in Star Wars. You guys can check out that playlist right around here. Also, be sure to check out our new channel, Generation Films, where we're starting a series breaking down various space marine organizations. And of course, we started off with the Clone Trooper. So also check out that corner right there to see that video. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button. My name is Alan. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.